Mrs. Lagarde, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, uh, you are discussing corruption and corruption costs for the region. What message is the IMF trying to convey uh, in that matter? We have uh, determined about six months ago uh, that uh, it was important for the IMF to actually identify what we call the vulnerability points. Because we have really convinced ourselves and convinced the board of the IMF that corruption matters macroeconomically. The more corruption you have, the less growth you have. This is, you know, uh, evidence that we have identified in our research. And uh, it seems to us that it's not only an issue of growth, it's also an issue of trust. And uh, we have also found out that the more corruption there is, the less trust there is, the less revenue um, generation uh, there is, and the less young people actually believe in the institutions that run their countries. So we believe that it's really a worthy cause to pursue um, for the macroeconomic consequences of it, but more generally from a, a good stability point of view. So the board last, last, uh, last year actually adopted uh, this resolution that we, the IMF, should be looking uh, in our economic audit of our membership at those vulnerability points that I talked about. What are they? Well, procurement generally is a vulnerability point. Uh, revenue generation, custom uh, uh, authorities are generally areas where possibly, if it is poorly structured, if there are too many bottlenecks, uh, if there are too many uh, procedures where you can actually identify a, a source for corruption. So we will be having that dialogue with all countries and certainly we will do that in the region as well, which is not worse, not better uh, than uh, other countries around the world. Any estimates for the cost of uh, corruption in the region? No, we don't have the estimate of the overall cost of corruption. What I can give you is the estimate we have for the cost of bribery around the world. And we are anywhere between $1.5 trillion and $2 trillion. So you're really talking about something which is significant. When it comes to the region, the, the price of oil is essential in uh, predicting uh, the economic growth. And uh, wh what is the outlook on the price of oil? Do you believe that uh, volatility uh, will continue and thus are, are risks skewed to the downside for the region? Well, first of all, uh, we have seen volatility you know, since 2014, where it was way up and then went down and then back up again, and, and in the last few months, down by 30%. So that volatility in and of itself is a source of instability. And uh, when governments at the moment do their budgeting, uh, it's hard actually for them to say whether it's going to be around 60, closer to 70. What we try to take into account ourselves is future. Um, prices so that we can assess more or less what markets are forecasting in terms of uh, price per barrel depending on the quality of oil. So that's, we are, that's what we are using. Are we right? Are markets right? Future will tell, really. And it depends on uh, geopolitical developments, you know, Venezuela comes to mind, uh, geopolitical uh, difficulties in the region could come to mind as well. The demand addressed by China to the uh, oil producing countries is also going to make a difference. But you know, in the region you have both oil exporting and oil importing region. So in a way when you look at the entire region there is a balancing effect where what benefits some will actually disadvantage others. So we are we're looking at the region as a whole and generally distinguish between the oil exporting and the oil importing. We have reset uh, the growth forecast for the oil exporting countries by one percentage point because of recent volatility and the fact that prices since last October have gone down. For the oil importing countries, we have maintained roughly our forecast for uh, this year and next. Uh, the region, you are predicting a, a pickup in growth next, next year, year for, yeah. for the region. But are these growth rates enough to tackle the, the problem of unemployment, for instance? It's never enough. I've, no, I've, I've yet to see 
uh, a leader of a country or a finance minister who is happy with enough growth. So everybody wants a bit more growth. Uh, and clearly for the region and for the number of young people coming to the market who want and expect jobs. No, it's not enough. What kind of growth rates are needed? Like above 5% you, do you think? You know, it's not so much the, uh, the growth rate, uh, but it's the uh, job creating growth. Uh, that is important and uh, at this point in time you have to look at the number of young people coming to the markets in the next five years it's, we're talking about 25 million young people coming to markets and those jobs have to be identified madame lagarde let's discuss a bit lebanon because lebanon had had a problem and now they have a government and we all know that uh, they are facing some issues in the sustainability of uh, uh, debt uh, my question to you, Lebna Lebanon did not come to the IMF to seek assistance. Uh, if you would good, give advice to this country, what would you tell them to do now with the new government? You know, we have a, a very steady relationship with Lebanon. So while we, we do not have a program, so to speak, we are in constant dialogue about what they should do in terms of policies. And what I've heard Prime Minister Ariri uh, say earlier today is that he's determined to actually implement uh, very uh, radically all the measures that he has put in his government statement, uh, which include fiscal consolidation, which includes structural reforms, which includes tackling at last the issue of electricity prices. Uh, and, you know, all those things we, are, we would love to celebrate as success for Lebanon in a few, in a few months. If we want to talk about the uh, global risks now, we know that uh, things are not looking very well in Europe. We might face a, a recession now in uh, Germany and uh, uh, the UK is uh, facing the risk of Brexit. So is it possible, you are saying that we're not going to see a global recession in 2019. Is it possible that th we will see that in 2020 if Brexit happened without a deal or if the uh, tra trade talks between China and the United States fail? What we are certain of is that we have big risks on the horizon and the horizon is getting a bit closer to us. So you have the trade tensions which are still unresolved. The outcome of those discussions between China and, and the United States is uncertain. The time is short and the problems that they're trying to deal with are monumental in my view. Uh, you have financial tightening, you know, cost of financing is going to go higher and that will apply to sovereign and corporates in particular that are heavily indebted in, uh, you know, foreign denominated currencies. And you also have, um, I wouldn't call the sort of recession in Europe, I would certainly wouldn't go for that, but I would say that there is uncertainty as to what the Brexit outcome will be and whether it's very good a very bad outcome, it will be less favorable and more friction uh, than what the UK has had with the rest of the, of the European Union. So it will have an impact and it will reduce uh, the growth forecast for that, that region. Thank you. Thank you so much.